Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, it, as Dimitri said, I'm a founder at Ladybug Tools. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you freedom and flexibility to model real world complexity. This is the take two. If uh, you have seen our presentation at the AEC Tech, that was the take one, which we did last year. Um, and the presentation is, uh, let me see, is mostly around uh, pollination and uh, what we have been doing uh, for pollination development and how we are developing pollination to deal with the real world complexity. I think you can, at any point, you can ask questions, but we can have the Q&A at the end, uh, answer uh, the questions as you want. So we have the full hour. Um, I have a good number of slides, but uh, I go through them uh, pretty quickly probably. So I hope like we have enough time at the end to to have a good uh, Q&A session too. So before I get this started, this is the team um, who builds Pollination. Uh, there are so many uh, familiar faces there and there are the coming, like as you can see, there's the relationship between Ladybug Tools and Pollination. Many of them are contributors to the Ladybug Tools project. And uh, the story that we had is uh, for anyone, who, if in case you don't know, is we started in 2013, Ladybug uh, started as an open source plugin for Grafter. And we have been around and growing naturally, like releasing uh, new, newer plugins. And then at some point in 2018, starting the Ladybug Tools LLC office, uh, mainly at the time as a consulting business. Uh, it was Chris and I, two of us, uh, starting it. And then um, after a couple of months, we applied for a grant and we received an SBIR grant uh, that is like how we really started thinking about pollination as a product and started the development. So before I get us started, uh, I want to thank the US Department of Energy and the SBIR award, which made uh, this development possible with the speed that we developed uh, stuff. So the things that I'm going to cover is one is what's pollination, then how does it work? Uh, what makes pollination pollination? What are our principles? Uh, why do you need pollination? You already know, see the title. And why should you start using pollination? So pollination is an ecosystem of tools for environmental building design and simulation. And the reason we build this ecosystem is we want to help you to get from question to answer and then actionable data quickly. So if you have a question and this side and actionable data is what we want, usually in projects, what people really want is this. What really happens is this. Just get to so many problems. You just, you just at some point you forget, you don't have enough time. If you have done it enough, like then you probably go through this. And what we really want to do for you is to help you go through this process in a repeatable modular way as you saw with initial question, get to initial data, inform uh, your next question and have an informed question and get to an actionable data. So this is the overall uh, process. And if this was too abstract, this one shouldn't be too abstract. When you have a project uh, architect on the top, engineer or consultant on the bottom, and the deadline, uh, what usually happens is after that great uh, kickoff meeting, we just go and uh, the engineer or consultant waits for the architect to give them a design uh, option. The design option comes, which I think like there were a lot of presentations today about like how we don't share data, how like the models goes, how we don't have a standards, like all the things that you already know. And because of that, uh, like there will be a delay which goes all into cleaning up the model or to be really like closer to what really happens, people like redraw everything from scratch. So this translation from design model to analytical models is so broken that a lot of people have told us like we rather to redraw everything from scratch instead of using the, the design model because it's just not ready for the job. <clears throat> then there is a, a smaller portion of the whole process that they really run the study. And at the end you get a reply with an email and a report and say, okay, great. We did all this stuff for you. And then you look at this and you see, oh, um, there has been two weeks or a week, it's been a week or two where we didn't have any feedback and guess what? The design has changed and there is this thank you, but not really thank you situation that you have all this report, but you can't use it. 
you just go with the design has changed, you probably put this uh, pretty pictures in your uh, report that, oh, you know what, like we are doing some studies and we will redo it for the model later. And yes, there are usually updated models that people send like during the process and you just ignore it because you don't have time for it. And this is not a good workflow. But what pollination does is what's bringing and like providing a layer between the two makes it easier and like makes it a structure to collaborate. So the way it works now, instead of waiting for an option, you just start like what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And they say, for example, we want to run a radiation study or we want to do a sunlight average study. You know, we have glare issues, load calculation for energy. We care about outdoor comfort. Any of this, all of this can be a recipe or a logic that will be developed and will be deployed to pollination. So the user on the other side, instead of sending you the full model, can use our CAD plugins to interact with that. They can load that uh, recipe and, and run it on their side. They will give you some feedback. It doesn't work. Then there will be improvement. And at some point, on the design side, the solution is good enough to be used uh, until the end. There can be a final wrap up for the solution or the recipe as we call it. And then it deploys at version 1.0, very similar to how software is developed and deployed and shared. And this gives you all this extra time on the design side. You can, you can do more iteration, you can get more projects and it gives, uh, it, it takes, takes out this problem of like, oh, someone is out of the office, so we, they can run this simulation for us. Uh, basically, this will uh, bring you to an streamlined uh, workflow. So to make that happen, we had to develop four different technologies. One is our cat plugins are responsible to help you to build your clean analytical model. Then you have recipes. Recipes are reusable and reproducible and customizable units of logic. The recipes that we currently have are, all of them are uh, around environmental building design. And then we have cloud computing, which is a technology to help you run larger simulations faster in scale. Web interface, which is the hub for collaboration. So these four technologies together makes the whole pollination ecosystem. And I have one slide to show you how this uh, different individual ecosystem works together. So first of all, this is a hybrid solution. This is not a cloud only solution, and this is not a desktop only solution. You have desktop on the uh, left side, cloud on the right side. Uh, our chat plugins are desktop applications that you can use to create the analytical model. We have a format HBJSON uh, for, for uh, transferring data, another format schema that has been introduced today. Uh, and uh, to you, I mean, by, introduced today, I mean, like during this uh, uh, conference or work, uh, whatever this symposium uh, people have talked about. Uh, and then this analytical model can be input for our recipes that we have. And uh, because of the web interface, now we have this QA, QC step in the middle that you can have an analytical model and you can see it. It actually can happen on desktop too, but the web uh, opens it up to more people to be involved. And then you can run the recipes locally and visualize the result. And you can run the recipes on pollination in a scale and go back and visualize the result. So this ecosystem that we're building. How does it work? I try to make it very simple. So I usually talk about why we did the stuff the way we did first, but this time I reversed it. I'm going to talk a lot about what, and then I talk about why at the end. So you get a better sense of like, what are the things that we're building? So how does it work? As of now, if just to keep it simple, this is how it works. You need to prepare your model or models for parametric studies. You can use Polymesh and CAD plugins, or you can use your own uh, way of generating those models. Then in the second step, you select an existing recipe or you develop a new one if the existing one is not good enough for you or you modify an existing recipe. And then after that, you run the recipe, which again, you can run it locally or you can run it on Polymesh if you want. And finally, you visualize the result, which you can do it locally, or you can do it on Pollination, or you can do it on any other app that you have using our API. So as you can see here, like the, the, way, the different ways that you can use it is not necessarily a linear process. And that goes back to the complexity of the real world that I just talked about. But I hope this gives you a good understanding of like, if you want to get a start today, what are the steps that you have to go through? So, 
what are these pollination cat plugins that I talked about? There are three of them right now uh, for Revit, Rhino, and Grasshopper. So the one for Revit, the main value for position is it helps you to get clean analytical model out of your uh, Revit model. If you have been in this area, you already know how hard this is. This is like weeks of work, uh, days of work, depending on the size of the model that now is like done in minutes. <clears throat> and here is a comparison of using the Revit GVXML exporter or going through pollination plugin and generate a HVJSON file and then export the GVXML using the, the HVJSON file. The next one is the Rhino plugin. So the goal of the Rhino plugin is really to blur the line between design and analytical model. We are bringing a lot of great thing that 3D modeling uh, CAD plugins have to energy modeling side. And by energy, when I say it's mainly like environmental device, energy, daylight, comfort. So all the apps, if you have used any of the software that are available uh, for years to do this stuff, they usually work in pure 2D, which is not a problem, but the problem is like there are so many things that you cannot do, like normal stuff, like undo, redo, selecting multiple rooms, like taking the whole through them up, like this stuff that in 3D is very simple in energy simulator are like for most of software is are non-existent. So that's the one thing we're making Rhino a full fledged uh, interface for preparing and running your environmental analysis. <clears throat> then because it's Rhino and we have the uh, geometry flexibility, we can basically treat any uh, an, an analytical model as a design model. We can use all the functionalities that are available in Rhino you know, to quickly edit your model. The size doesn't matter as much. We have done models up to 1,200 rooms with no issues for solving adjacencies and all. Then the next thing that the Rhino plugin is providing is to help you identify resolve modeling errors before they become a problem. This is, again, one of the uh, items that we found takes most of the time from people when we talk to them. Is The thing is, like, at least the way the software is right now, most of them, you don't know the error in your model until you run the simulation, get an error when the simulation is, is, has been executed. So our approach right now is like to add these commands, like this one that helps you in 3D see the rooms that are not touching and very close together that will create issues for solid adjacency. Uh, we also implemented the same for 2D. Uh, so this is an example of like a real project 2D plans that comes in and you think the lines match. Well, they don't. Uh, if I click on one of those, you can see like how far they are and you can fix it. This is similar to how show edges, for example, works in Rhino. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It shows you the problem that you can solve it. We have a good full suite of commands. So some of them automate the whole process. Like we have rebuild 2D that basically uh, snap all your plans to grid so you can do that uh, in, in seconds instead of days. And finally, uh, we have this uh, an SDK for the Rhino plugin, uh, for our plugin for the Rhino plugin, that will allow you automate your stuff quickly. So this is a sample UI that's created to a uh, size of the windows uh, based on window wall ratio, based on orientation of the building. And the main difference here is there is no grasshopper, right? Everything is now done in Rhino, which means a much larger audience than the Ladybug Tools plugins in Grasshopper. Then we have a Grasshopper plugin. The main proposition of the Grasshopper plugin is to allow you run parametric studies in a scale. From the Rhino plugin, you can also run parametric studies, but you have to set them one by one, and it can take a lot of time. Grasshopper is the UI, the user interface, which is optimized for doing so, and we are using it for that. Then something that's actually shared between all the plugins, but I wanted to show here uh, because we had a good animation for it is now you can actually share your workflows with control. Uh, Pollination has role-based, <coughs> sorry, role-based access control. And you can basically develop this recipes deployed to Pollination and then your team internally or with your client externally or with everyone based on how you want. And people can access it from our plugin like how it shows in this example that it's loading the daylight factor recipe into Grasshopper. The other great thing about the Grasshopper plugin is because of its flexibility, uh, you have workflows that you can recreate your whole simulation. So if there is an instance of a simulation that you have run on Pollination, 
at any point of time when the project comes back or you need a new visualization or someone wants to take the whole simulation, do a queue and QA, QC locally, you can do that. As you can see, that's real grasshopper definition and that's like a real model um, that, that we are loading into grasshopper right now. And finally, everything is done inside the cat plugin. And this is shared within Grasshopper, Rhino, and Revit. The whole design idea is you don't have to leave to web to do some stuff and then come back. This is comes from this ideology or like this uh, principle that if as soon as you separate the design model from the analytical model, they will go their own way, then it will be really hard to sync them back together. And that's something that we are trying to keep together. I'll talk a little bit more about like how we are doing all that. Um, <clears throat> so that was the CAT plugins. Let's talk a little bit about the web-based platform and what is the web-based platform and what it does and why it's important. So the first thing is it's a cloud computing platform. So what it does is runs your simulations in a scale. So if you have a recipe that has a step that can run in scale, this is like you can see it's running like on I think for this example like 300, 400, like different machines in parallel. Um, that's one thing. The reason we say up to 100 times faster, not 300 times faster, 400 times faster, there's a blog post for that. Go read that. It can be more than 100 times faster, depending on the case. Then the other thing that comes with Pollination is you can think about it as a project management platform for your building simulation. So we have members, teams that you can uh, define, and then there are projects and inside projects you have this what we call jobs that you run so all the jobs that has been executed inside that project are accessible to all the team members who have access to that project again you can think about it like a mini project management platform for your building simulation workflows then after that uh, one of the things that web-based platform allows us doing is to let people get really deep into details if you know our company how we think about all this being transparent, educating our users and helping people to get through this process of being like a beginner to be an expert is part of our mission. And we are very serious about that uh, to make sure we're not another company to just automate garbage in garbage out. And this is one of those. So we, we have spent a lot of time making sure in our UI are explorable and you can access them from the cat plugins, go to the web and see like, what is this recipe that I'm running? What is every single step? Again, uh, you, sh you should be obvious, but just to make sure you don't have to. This is an option. And again, this is part of our uh, approach that we really care about more advanced users or the people who really want to learn. We want to help you, we got your back uh, during the process. And finally, uh, because it's, uh, hybrid solution, there is no concept of lock-in necessarily because you can use the cloud computing or you can run the same simulation locally if you want. That will also help you to keep uh, your cloud average only for simulation when it does matter instead of having a solution that you have to run everything on cloud or to run everything on desktop. This is basically a choice and depends on the, on, uh, on the case you can, you can make decision to do. Okay. With that, I hope now you have a good understanding of like what pollination is. Now I can talk a little bit more about our guiding principles, why we did this stuff the way we did it, and some of the things that we, some of the decisions that we made particularly uh, for some very particular reasons. So here's, here are our, uh, there is a lot that talks about the four automation, customization, collaboration, and democratization. It's not that long actually that you can go and read at that uh, link down there. But the summary shortlist are this that I want to go through. And I think this is one of the few slides that has no image here. So uh, bear with me. So the first one is acknowledge that real world problems are inherently complex. And when we talk about problems being complex, I'm not talking about geometry. People think like the geometry is complex or something. The, the collaboration is complex. The whole process, and that's why a speckle, I think, exists, right? Because there are different, like the whole process is collaborative and different stakeholders are in the process that they need to share data. Sometimes something that a person wants to put in a model is only available to some other party in the process that they use a different tool, that they use a different language, they use a different way to document this. 
this makes the whole process complex, trying to come back and say, oh, everything is simple, we can do everything, everyone can do everything, is going to hurt us. This is one thing that we are very aware of. The other thing, if you understand it's complex, you accept that the real world is imperfect. Your input models are going to be imperfect. Your BIM models, your IFC files, CAD files, simulation inputs, everything is going to be imperfect. This is part of your design to design for imperfection, uh, to make sure you are ready for that. You know, you're not designing, like one of the interesting quotes that when we were talking to one of the offices was, someone said, we have all this great uh, workflows that we have developed in house and they all work with a clean model and we never get a clean model. So all we do is like try to clean the model and then we can't use any of this. And that's, that's what I mean. Like, how do you deal with the imperfection of the real world and how do you build tools that can help with that? Then the next one is recognize there is no such a thing as one size fit all solution. I think this is very tempting for um, developing a cloud solution. You know, like you just do a market research and you figure out 90% of the market are going to use this thing. So these are the four things that we're going to develop and everyone is going to use them and like they're all happy. Um, the story is good. Uh, and when you talk about it, but it's not going to make our buildings better. There is no one size fits all. There are a lot of similarities, but you have to develop a system that has this customize, customization built in. The user shouldn't go through a lot of pain to customize something if they need it. It should be built in. It should be part of your principles when you uh, develop the tool. And then your questions will evolve over time, so should your processes, uh, similar to the above. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And uh, the last one is customization and education comes before automation. And if you can't customize an automated processes, and if you don't know what is that automated process is, there is a great chance that you're just running a garbage in, garbage out automation very fast. And that's something that we are very aware of and we don't want to do. We don't want to build a tool that help people run hundreds of garbage in garbage out, maybe thousands of garbage in garbage out instead of running one. You know, that's not a good thing and that's not going to make the whole building industry better. So customization and education should also be part of the whole thing that how you build it uh, and, and how you present it to the people. And recipes, I think, are one of the components, one of the technologies that kind of uh, brings a lot of these principles together. Sorry, they're production ready, they're modular, they're reusable, and they're customizable. They are the way you define your workflow. I'm going to show my famous uh, slide of how recipes are, like what we learned from uh, cooking recipes is the decoupling of the statement of the problem from the execution of the problem. This is a problem that we had before, right? A statement of the problem, how what you want to solve should be separated from how you will solve that. Why is that important? Because then anyone can cook, anyone can run your recipe in different platform. Because of how we have written the recipes now, you can run the same recipe locally. For the developers on here, we are using Luigi uh, for running them locally. And then you can run it on Polynesian, which we use Argo. So we have the same definition of the problem and we have the code that translates them to executable code on both sides. You can also run them on Linux and Windows. So basically you are writing one recipe, you can run it on both sides. This is not only in important for uh, being able to execute them easily, but it's also important to make sure our collaborations are not broken. So this is the one example that I put together of when you run a study to do uh, blind calculation, like dynamic blind. Usually you run direct sunlight and you run glare studies, and this can be two different recipes, right? And you get the result. And with the current design, you can have all this deployed to Polynesian Cloud, your account, and you can, you can basically use it into your process. Then what happens is, what if now you need to, sorry, to calculate also direct reflection because there is a building, highly reflective building next to your project now. If this is not modular and if you cannot share it in this way, then you have to go to all the way back to what, where we were, right? Just like, oh, we don't have this module. So here we go, consultant. This is our Revit model again. Thank you for running all of this for us. Now you can collaborate with just adding a new module. So your consultant can write their own recipe 
add it, and then you can add it to your whole workflow without breaking the whole collaboration process. And the other thing that comes with recipe is now you can build cloud native scalable solutions without really understanding how the cloud works. And let me tell you, it's really a strange how it works. It takes a lot of time to go and educate yourself about that. So how is that possible? So the whole uh, workflow language that we use for running uh, uh, stuff on like running workflows and jobs, runs, uh, simulations, everything that I call, call them on pollination is comes from Queenbee, which is a workflow language that we develop. Uh, we, if you go to documentation, you see we, we have been inspired with a lot of existing workflow languages and we optimize it for environmental building simulation and long running tasks. And then, we also developed a pollination domain specific language, also known as DSL, uh, on top of it, which means instead of dealing with YAML, which is the format of Quimby, uh, you can actually write code in Python, write your workflow in Python, the pipeline, and then we compile that uh, to Luigi and Argo to run it locally or run it on uh, cloud. And this is important because now if you have a recipe written with this language, runs like on cloud in a scale without the need for you to understand like all the details that I just talked about. If you want to get started, here's the link. Uh, you can get it started today. Uh, Pollination DSL Wiki, there is a post about like how to write your own recipe. It will get us easier in the future. We are, we have experimented with solutions to have a web-based interface to allow you to build these recipes and put this uh, nodes that we have developed as plugins together so you can quickly build your own solutions. Um, but if you want to start right now, there are 20 recipes and all of them, 20 open source recipes that are, you can see the source code, you can see the examples, you can see how they work, you can modify them for your own use case if you want to start today. So that's one thing. So one was, you can write locally and you can write on cloud. The other one was, if you write it this way now, you can uh, basically develop cloud native solutions. So your recipe is the same as any recipe that we write. It's like a standard object on pollination, your custom solutions. The other thing is you can write it once and run it from everywhere. And by this, I mean, now if you are working on a solution locally and you write this recipe on your local machine and now you see it's a good one, and you want to deploy for your whole office to use it, it will take minutes. This is something that used to take weeks, if not months. And then you don't have to be worried about maintaining the whole infrastructure or anything. Just like write the recipe, push to pollination, it is available to everyone or like whatever, whoever you set the permission to have access to. It's also useful if you don't want to share with other people, but you want to run larger models. So you don't have to go through this process of oh, now, like oh, refactor the whole code again, because now we have a larger model when I develop that. So I'm going to use the daylight factor recipe as an example that uh, we have written and like it's now deployed on pollination and this is how it looks like, it's very simple. So when you have the recipe on pollination, that means you can run it from pollination, so no surprise. So if you go to a web-based platform and you start a new job, you can load a recipe here and then when you load the recipe, it shows all the inputs that you can add and you can run it. You can load the same recipe inside Rhino, right? In this case, this is inside Rhino. I say run simulation. I log in uh, the same project, the same recipe, same inputs. One thing that happened here, which is interesting, is the recipe is context aware. We have a concept of uh, alias inputs and handlers. So it realizes, oh, I'm running inside Rhino. So because I'm running inside Rhino, link it to the model that exists inside Rhino. Then the same idea in Grasshopper, right? This time it becomes a Grasshopper component. Again, same inputs. It looks like a standard uh, Grasshopper input. There is a difference here. There is an extra user inputs here as an input. And this is here because of the thing is specific. And again, that's part of the context awareness of recipe. So, the same recipe, the same logic based on different interfaces that you load them, they become native to that platform. Then here, this is for Revit. In Revit, we don't have a handler yet, so you have to load the file. And we are experimenting with this idea of having it as a desktop application, because why not? You have the logic, right, which runs everywhere. 
So if you can generate the UI programmatically, then you can basically say, oh, this is my recipe that I developed on Power Mission. I want to compile it all together as a desktop application and give it to my uh, client to use it as a desktop application. And that should work. So this is experimental. This is not available in the wild. The other four that I just showed, you can just test it today or, or right now if you want. So not only that solves this problem of like rewriting the code for different platforms, the other thing that it solves is this QA, QC issue that we have in the offices. You know, like aware of all this different grasshopper scripts that you have, which you think are the same script, but they're not the same because they have changed during the projects and you didn't know. And grasshopper is not a good platform to just do a comparison between two grasshopper definition that you have. Now, this is how it looks like. You have a single recipe on pollination, which is version, you can QA QC, and people can use the same recipe from all these platforms. And you know they're using the right recipe if you're the person in charge of uh, keeping these recipes updated and you know uh, fixing them and, and, doing, and updating them over time. Finally, I mean, I talked about this uh, several times, but again, to re as a reminder, it's cloud first, but it's not cloud only. It's, you can run it from all those platforms. And as I said, you can run it locally. And it's as simple as this in Rhino. So you just go and when you want to run it, you just say run it locally and then set the local runs and then pollinate and it will run locally. Or you just don't and it will run on the cloud. This is an example file that uh, this, this run is a cloud job, runs on cloud. This one is a local one uh, that I ran. And, and you can load the results from either. You can run from. I mean, like by now you should understand, you should know that. Like you can run from Rhino, load it from Grasshopper, or you can bring it to Grasshopper, run everything, and then bring it back to Revit and visualize it there. You don't have to, but you can. And a lot of projects, because of the complexity of the project, is staying inside the same platform is like a dream that never happened. I have not seen any project to go to like a start to end through the same software. If you have seen it, good for you. And this is how it looks from Grasshopper. So the same component, you just say run local, and now this is local. I can set the settings, like num how many CPUs, working folders, and then pollinate, and it just runs locally. Next, validation as a feature. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So when we are making all this and we automate all this stuff, the thing that comes and like bothers me a lot or like makes me nervous is Now we're making all these things faster, and not everyone can run from everywhere. It's smart system. These are all great things, but how do we make sure people are running the right model, or how we make sure like people can really enjoy this automation? Because you have all this automation, again going back to that code, we have all these great workflows, but they work when we have a clean model. We never get a clean model. So we basically wrote this validation routines um, that now you can execute from inside Rhino or Revit uh, or Grasshopper or from command line. And they basically tell you your model is validated before running it. If it's not validated, you give an error. This is very similar. The idea is like for developing code, you know, you don't, you, when you want to compile it, you get the errors or like your text editor tells you like this is wrong before you want to run it. So you don't wait all the time to, until like the thing runs and say, oh, I made a mistake. So this is the same thing. And because we are inside the CAD platforms, now we have this ability. I mean, we haven't done it, but just like sharing some uh, dreams here, ideas we're very close is when you get an error message, like how you get an error message in a code editor and you click on it and it takes you to the line that the error happens, you should be able to click on it and it should take you to that geometry in your model and say, this is what happens, fix it. Uh, so kind of like a debugging process as you are editing your model. And this is really helpful for contractual uh, purposes too. We have done some custom validation for the apps that we have developed in a way that like the person who prepared the models and the person who run the study basically shake hand at this point that if your model passes the validation code that we have, then we sign the contract, we pay you the money, the rest is on us. If it doesn't, then you have to fix it. So this will uh, hopefully like finish this like, uh, you know, uh, finger pointing of like who, whose fault is that, that like the model doesn't work. And the reason we can do that is because not only we standardize the workflow language, which was Queen Bee and Polynesian DSL, which I just showed, we also had to standardize the input format, uh, HB JSON and DF JSON for Dragonfly JSON. I'm not going to talk about Dragonfly JSON a lot, 
But HPJSON is a file format, which is a standard schema to describe buildings. It's optimized for environmental building design, of course. The advantages over the existing options for environmental building design, not all the schemas, I'm not talking about IFC, or I'm not talking about, I don't know, speckle format or any of those. Uh, I'm talking specifically about the ones that are available for building environmental design is one, it comes with a building validator, as I showed, so uh, that's the first step. There are only five geometry rules. Having access to both the schema and the translation we have relaxed the things that you need to put in the schema. Why is it important? Because this uh, simulation software, they have very restrict rules of how you define geometry. And this has been like a problem for CAD developers because you don't know all those rules. You're not an energy modeler or daylighting expert, or you know, like you don't know how radiance works, how energy plus works, how often the studio works, how they are different. We do know that. So to help you with that, our schema is just like, just give us the vertices and follow these five rules, which is very simple. Then we take care of sorting the points, we take care of validating, we take care of making sure like they go to the software the way that they should go. And that should make it much easier for other people to integrate and develop on top of HPJSON. It is developed as a multi-engine schema from day one. So it's not like, oh, we developed it for energy and then someone came and said like, oh, what about daylight thing? And like, oh, let's add some additional thing. No, from the start, we thought this should work for energy, daylight, CFD, uh, and, and even more. And there is already adoption that we're seeing. There is an effort to go with Do2 with Dragonfly. There is an effort to connect HPJSON to Passive House, which is uh, great to see. I should also give a shout out to the NREL Open Studio team who helped us with the development of the HPJSON uh, schema. And they're still helping us with the process. And also it's a scriptable. It comes uh, with two maintained SDKs for Python and C-sharp, which is what we use for our own plugins so you can trust them, uh, they work. This is just for the developers here to know, like we have C-sharp, Python uh, uh, SDKs and it is open API compatible. So we can generate uh, for different other SDKs for different languages, for other languages. We haven't done it mainly because no one asked for it, because we don't want to maintain more code if no but it's possible and then here on the side you can see you have the code to to go to all the simulation engines so in simply like it built look like this but what's interesting about hvjson is like we don't only have to go to analysis right we have now we now have a um, extension that goes to vtk which is a library for visualization which is what we use for all the web-based uh, visualization and, and you can also do local visualization. So this is our local visualization. And there are efforts I have been uh, told uh, for HVJSON connection to a, spe a speckle schema. So I think that's where things gets interesting. All this in interesting development that going around, you know, you have elements, high part is developing, speckle has their own schema. We have HVJSON, IFC is there, right? And the, the, like, we don't have all of us to just like follow the same schema. I think we should have interfaces to be able to talk to each other. And, and that will give us enough freedom and flexibility to uh, deal with real world complexity in this case. And because of HBJSON, since this is just an example, so you know, like this is like the level of interoperability now you can provide from the Rhino plugin. Uh, Everything goes to, uh, to, to HPJSON, then it goes to Rhino, then from HPJSON goes to all the other formats out there. And the same thing, because of HPJSON, we can go uh, from Rhino to Grasshopper and come back. We can go from Rhino to Revit. I mean, Revit doesn't import it. So we can go from Revit to Rhino and Grasshopper without losing any data in the process. And this is how this was possible. I showed this slide before, but I want to get back to it, that the reason this is possible is because of that standard geometry or model schema. Uh, getting closer to the end, uh, the whole thing that we are doing is encouraging your way, not our way. And if this is in two different ways, um, one is we are happy and we develop the whole platform to, for workflows like this. Again, there is a blog post about how you get a model from Revit, clean it inside Rhino, export the GBXML and take it to OpenStudio and IES. I don't think what we have, the complexity of the projects is like to change everyone who is like an advanced IES user or advanced design builder user and say, no, you have to use OpenStudio, that's the better option. Or you have to use uh, Polynesia for Rhino, that's the better option. Let people do what they need to do and support them during the process. And uh, that's what I mean, like your way, 
not our way. The other way of making sure your way is supported is to make sure we build it as extendable tool. So this is time that's features. I, I borrowed this from a very interesting post that I'll link down there, that the speed of the core product adding features is like this. You know, you start at some point, then you get higher. At some point you have so many users, things get tricky. You have to slow down. If you want to add something to core product, like now you have to talk to 10 people, you know, like make sure nothing breaks. And especially for our ecosystem of things, we are trying to keep everything isolated, but you know, like, like someone else was saying today too, like if you want to get to the core product, everyone will use it. And then that means like a lot of decisions of like, is this something that everyone wants to use? And then you have what user. So initially it's nothing because the product is not out there. When it gets out there, people ask, we're asking for more and more and more Then they have edge cases and they want to do things. And what they want to do makes sense because they have real projects and they have real needs. And that's the place that plugins and custom scripts are going to make up for your core products to your needs. I think Rhino and what McNeil team has done with Rhino and Grasshopper is a very good example of a very good successful example of this, that how they have made this developing plugins and scripts easy for everyone. So a lot of things that we want never made it to the Rhino core features, but everyone is happy because you still have a way to do it. There is another product in the market, which is not like that, which just starts with an R and I'm not going to name. Uh, so anyways, these are two examples here. This is a code that basically gets takes away of all the rooms of, you know, area, volume, expose data. If you want to quickly get this and if you come to us and say, I want an export, export there to CVS, CSV or uh, to Excel. So here you go, like this is a code and this code is already available on GitHub. If you go to our user manual, you can find it and test it today. This is another one that again, I showed, which is for window to wall ratio. We have several examples for editing a model, uh, creating a model from scratch. Um, and I don't know what was the third one, like, but there are th three different examples. And we have like a, poll if I, we want to have one law for pollination, it's, it should be loved by experts and used by everyone. And this has been our approach uh, from day one. And I tell you why this is important because we are building a platform that change beginner users into industry experts over time. We have done this with Ladybug tools and that was very limited to what like Grasshopper, Rhino community can, can offer. And now pollination with the scale of the web and accessibility, we can do it in a much larger scale to help people learn, educate themselves, get better. And to do that, you need a network and you need a network where experts are in and like beginners are in, and we have both ends of the market that they can help each other uh, to, to build better together, right? So pollination is this hub that we are starting to contribute the recipes. Some of these recipes that we have there, and I said like, we have close to 20 open source recipes up there, are the ones that like this quality of recipe was not available and it's not available to a normal office. It's just like something you have to have like this larger offices who keep for themselves. We are just opening this up to everyone so we can move forward, right? You can see how it runs, you can, you can do, you can change them, you can do whatever you want to do with it and you can educate yourself. The next wave is community. And again, as I said, it's very important for us to make sure people can, can uh, contribute and like the, you can solve your day-to-day -day problem and we are here to help you during that process. And of course, there's enterprise. We already developed solutions using uh, this uh, ecosystem for our customers. Um, and I think we keep developing that. So there will be a healthy uh, balance of you know, enterprise solution that might stay private forever, community solution that are always open source, and then a mix of solutions that we built that are going to be private and open for everyone to use. This is an older slide uh, that I think we showed in 2018 when we started the company that if you have, if you start from root and come like all the way trunk, you know, like have the right tree, it can go up here. If you rebuild these trees one by one, separate from each other, this is the part that are reusable and we can't go that far if we do the one on the right. I think this has been a pattern for the presentations uh, for the last two days that I have seen. Um, I want just to reiterate, this is real. Like we need to build better together. And 
this is basically what we're trying to do to make it easier for everyone to contribute. So the engines are developed by Department of Energy, you know, like they have been funded for years uh, with tax figures get to a place that they are. We have developed the APIs on top of those. We have developed the CAD plugins on top of that. And all you need to do now is to write these scripts and develop this recipe and you have your own custom built, customizable, scalable solution. I think this is amazing, right? To be able to do that, to be at a place to even think about this being possible is a big thing and we are there. And uh, the good thing is like, we are not the only one who is thinking like this or who is trying to do this, right? There are several solutions out there. So if you think like that, then the future is bright. Uh, hopefully not too bright. Uh, yeah, just to know like GitHub is a very well-known example of trying to do something similar and it has been very successful. There is Project Kaggle for machine learning uh, that there are data sets and notebooks, what they call it, which is similar to the concept of recipes there. So you don't start from scratch. You have all this data set that you can play with and people share what they do. Observable is trying to do that for data visualization. And our friends at Hype are also trying to do that for the building industry. Uh, our scope is much more like focused on what we're trying to do, but Hype is trying to do very similar uh, concept for the for overall uh, sharing what they call building system or knowledge, crowdsourcing building knowledge, I think what is what Anthony called it yesterday. Um, and the famous code that I have been using for years now, when an expert network is functioning at its best, the smartest person in the room is the room itself. And that's where we want to go. And that's where we want to be. So if you want to start today, you can start. We got your back. We're here to help you. If you're a beginner user, you can access the recipes for your studies from the CAD tools. I showed Rhino, Revit, and Grasshopper. They're all out. Uh, you can start using the one that you're more comfortable with. You can visualize results inside the CAD plugins. You don't need to go to any of the complexities that I just mentioned. It just works. And yeah, just enjoy that. Good for you. If you're an expert, then all the beginner stuff is an option, but you can also develop your own recipes or customize available recipes. Uh, if you develop your own recipe, it will be in a fraction of time than what you have done before because you don't need to write all the code to get there. We have all these functions that you can basically mix and merge and get to a new solution. It's very similar to having Grasshopper with all these plugins, you can build a solution that would have taken you ages if you wanted to write all the code for everything. But now it's uh, happening uh, on a web-based platform. And then you can share it with uh, internal or externally with zero infrastructure, infrastructure development. I mean, you don't have to think about any of the infrastructure that you need to share it, to maintain it, to just like, uh, like how people are going to use it, when people are going to use it, and like when the server is going to be down. That's not your problem anymore. For software developers, uh, everything that comes with for beginners and advanced users, plus you can build your own plugins now uh, using the HP JSON format. Just basically, if you write to HP JSON format or Dragonfly format, uh, Dragonfly JSON, you have access to all the things that I showed. One of the projects that's currently actively is, is doing this is SAM, Single Analysis Modeling Environment. Um, they showed it uh, during the open source uh, OS Arch group. It, it uses a topologic on, under the hood, but it, it comes to HP JSON and connects to Energy Plus Open Studio for simulations. And you can also integrate all the recipes that we have to, to your applications for all the 3D app developers out there um, that generating buildings and optimizing buildings and everything that you do. The recipes are there. There is an open uh, API, public API, and there are SDKs to talk to that API, uh, or if you don't want to use the API directly to develop that. We have 10 minutes uh, and I'm done. So upcoming feature just for people who stayed all the way to the end of the presentation. So you know what are the things, no promises, but these are the things that we're working on. One is we are adding simple environmental analysis to Rhino plugin. So we did all this complex, complicated, some, some of them, the stuff of like very advanced simulation, but what people really love about Ladybug tools and Ladybug is like this simple simulation, simple informative simulations that they can do almost real time. And now we're bringing those in Rhino. This is, a, this is an experiment that we are doing and so far it has been very successful. So this is something to probably to be added uh, sooner than later. Then, 
uh, we are improving the recipe viewer. This is a this is a kind of like a prototype that we built using a project. Um, you can see like how it allows you to go back and forth in different level of abstraction of the workflow, so you can make sense of it uh, of how it works. Maybe we use this also for our builder. We don't know yet, but I just wanted to show this, and I have already pitched this to MacNeil to, if possible, provide it to um, to Grasshopper. So you can uh, you can just uh, enjoy it. The project is open source. Kedro is is part of Kedro. You should check it out. It's a very interesting project uh, for machine learning. They have very similar concepts to Paul mission. No surprise, but yeah, like I wish we knew about them. I mean, they were not they they were not existed when we started our stuff, so it's okay. And then we are starting to do partial support for IFC. Like, let's be clear, this is partial support for IFC, not like we're just testing it because uh, it's IFC and we will see how far we can go. There is a good vibe around IFC and I think like more tools are using IFC. So we want to see what is possible and if we can bridge the gap between IFC and HPJSON to all this uh, different simulations that we have. For upcoming events, we have a user meetup tomorrow, which is actually at the same time that the Speckle event is happening, sorry, but like if you want to get involved, we have monthly uh, user meetups that we show the stuff that we're doing and like we, we talk about them, you can be involved and just sign up to our newsletter. If you haven't, you can find it on our website, go to pollination.cloud, go all the way in the bottom of the page. If you want to do hands-on workshop, we do a six hour workshop as part of the AEC Tech. It's in two weeks, I think, one, two weeks on Thursday, November 4th. Uh, I hope to see some of you there. And yep, here we go, like your entire ecosystem in one place, but in an open ecosystem, not a closed one. Thank you so much. I have to say thank you, Mostafa. This was a brilliant presentation. So now a note to the audience, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. We will make Mostafa answer them within reason, of course. And uh, from my end, I'm just like blown away because I think I've never actually witnessed like the full scope of what you guys have been building for the past three years or more. It's really impressive. So hats off. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm, um, and also like for the presentation itself, like I've got many takeaways from it personally. So from, from your core principles, like design for imperfection, I did have like, one question, because um, you've mentioned like how difficult it is to marry all these kind of principles that actually deal with a bit of noise with actually making a usable product that doesn't have too many gizmos and widgets and sliders and, and things to, to fill in. Well, I think like one of the things that we learned during the development that helped with that is every single part of the ecosystem, be comfortable that every single part of the ecosystem, they will have a different personality. When we started, we were thinking like Revit plugin and Rhino plugin and Grasshopper plugin, they all should do the same thing because you know, like this concept that you want to stay in. And that actually ended up to be, to trying to make Revit do things that Revit is not designed to do, <laughs> you know? And then yeah. not adding a stuff to Rhino that Rhino is great to do because then Rhino plugin will be different from the Revit plugin. Um, and I like, yeah, like we use our own rule, like the basically real world complexity uh, smacked that in the face and like, <laughs> no, like things are going to be different. Mm -hmm. Things are going to be slightly different. It's okay to have, to have them as long as you talk the same language so people can find their way during the software. And I think that helps a lot not to end up with like a lot of, you know, small details here and there, because then yeah. you define the scope for every plugin very clarified or every part of this ecosystem very clarified. And that helps to always ask this question. I think on our team, Antoine is, does a great job on that of like, is this feature really long to this part of the ecosystem? And if the answer is no, like, no, let's not do it. Yeah, that's that's a good lesson for even like the specklers listening. I think that we should take on board partially. I also like like because there are there questions from the audience. Do drop them in. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I'm excited because I get to grill Mustafa by myself. So. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, totally. Like um, you mentioned, like customization and education before automation, and I think that's that's a very powerful principle, and a kind of a very powerful kind of um, statement, right? And I wholeheartedly agree. I just my question is, when do you find the time and energy to actually do both, or what's the proportion in which you do them? <laughs> Well, I mean, when, when I say education and customization, especially for the education, I mean like the, the option for people to educate themselves and the option for people to customize your solution more than me uh, educating or us educating every person. And uh, it, if we learn one thing, the best way of educating education for us is to help people is learning by doing, but learning by doing in a safe environment. So the way that that has helped us is like we built our tools in a way that it's safe to fail. And if something goes wrong, you see why it's going wrong. And if it doesn't tell you why, like that's a bug, it will fix it for you. That helps people to come in and like you can see the pattern. Now people come in, they run like five wrong things. Um, and then we go back and say, hey, this is because you're not doing that. And that's the time that person will learn it forever because he, he or she has been through that process, you know, she has tried, she has failed, I can teach them. And this has been like, I, we, for example, if you go to any of our executions and click on every single node, they show you the command that has been executed, they show you all the inputs and they show you all the outputs. How many percentage of the user do you think will care about that? A small, very small, we know mm -hmm. that. Well, we built that in because those are the people who really care to go and check that and learn about that, those are the people who will make the real meaningful change in the future, right? So I think that has been our, it's, it's kind of like people ask about open source too, like why do you open source this stuff when it's like a lot of extra work? It's just when you think this is part of your plan, then you budget for it, right? If you think this is part of your task, then you budget for it, you do it. If you think it as like an extra thing that we have to do, then it's easy to, to ignore it and like forget about doing it. Totally. Like, I, I understand. I remember in a previous life, I was like a very, uh, like, I, I struggled a bit with Ladybug actually trying to shoehorn it. And again, me, not an environmental expert, having not, no clue, just trying to string together Grasshopper components from the old Grasshopper forum. Um, and I really lacked actually at that point that the patience or the, actually the, the time to understand it. But like at the time, I remember like I really wished like that I would finally have a spot, a time in my career as an architect back then to actually learn this properly. And I think it's really important that you offer a path for that. But yeah, you see, like in pollination, I think we are being like a little bit more easy going. Definitely, seeing it's seeing to start, right easier. It's much easier to start, but it's a still fail to save. I think that's the. That's yeah, and I mean, seeing the product now, I must say, if there's any kind of like product managers or company directors listening in, you, it, it, it's much more inviting for me. So I would know that I would be able to get to a productive result and learn throughout the process using pollination rather than the trial and error stuff that I had to go through back in the day. So great to hear. So let me it. like show this. This is like, if you have more questions, you can go to pollination.community. And then you can, of course, email me Mustafa at Sign Pollination Cloud or Mustafa at Sign Ladybug Tools, so I can stop sharing my screen. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, I've got more questions if you have time. Are we? We're smack on yeah. time. Okay. Yes, I mean, I got 10 to 15 minutes before I go actually pick up my son, which is just interesting, okay. like how, how the <laughs> morning presentation I had to drop him off and now like, to drop I'm him off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, first of all, actually, hats off. Thank you for waking up at 7 a.m. Yeah. and, and uh, coming here. Like, um, really my question is, like, kind of like the technical team and the team that you have behind us, like, you guys are probably context switching like 10 times a, a, a day. Like, how do you manage this? Well, I mean, that's a in very interesting, good question. That, first of all, it was really hard to find the right people for the team because of that. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean like you have to know every aspect of the product, but you should be able to understand enough to be able to talk right, about it and like right. understand what's going on. One thing that happened very naturally is now we have like very a smaller team inside our team. You know, we have a Rhino development team. For Revit, we uh, subcontracted um, 
uh, Conrad Archilab <laughs> is helping yeah. us, okay. yeah. uh, which, is, which is great. For the back end, we have our back end team, then we have our front end team of one for now. And then like <laughs> that makes the cloud team. And I think like we, we have built, and now we have a content manager who is trying to make everyone to speak a uh, human readable uh, language, <laughs> <laughs> which has been helpful. And yeah, I think like most of the, most of our team members, and we have of course, like the ladybug development core stuff that Chris takes care of like most of the, the work there. Mm -hmm. But um, I think except for myself, we are trying like, and we use this concept of projects to keep people like concentrated on the same project for a longer time, more than two weeks usually. That has helped mm -hmm. for people not to switch, need to switch a lot because that slows down everything a lot. But you know, it's not perfect. Like it happens sometimes and it's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really hard for myself to do that, to be honest. But yeah, we realize that sometimes it's a good thing. Like, I don't know like how people think and that's one of the things I can't see anybody's face. But we, I asked this question, you know, like, is there a part of this ecosystem that we could have not developed and I still have the same product you now? And so far the answer is no, but I can be blindsided, of course, but I feel no, I feel like this is the minimum that we could have done. We didn't pick on like two or three different B software. We didn't take on like two different NERP. We just like picked one for each, kind of building the prototype, building the whole infrastructure, and we will see where it goes from here. But yeah. I, I can tell you like one thing for everyone, we have a lot of internal conversations about like, you know, because now a change, like one side of collaboration is just, we show all this stuff and people are like, oh, this is great, everything works. Then you want to make a change to HPJ, so now you have to talk to like six different stakeholders <laughs> <laughs> internally. Yes, yeah. So it's not as easy. And we have tried to make everything extendable. Everything, we, are, we are learning. I think we're doing a much better job uh, for people to, to agree without talking a lot about one issue and like this is smaller teams I think it has been really helpful not gotcha. everyone works on everything yeah no it's impressive like I am blown away by the kind of the, the company that you've built Mostafa the, the, the starting from an open source project building a company the team and actually the the product that we're seeing now happening with pollination and how everything fits together. I mean, it's not fair to give me all the credits. Like it's the whole team well, really doing that, right? Yes. But yeah, I just got, I, I was at the right place at the right time, you know, like getting, and I think uh, Ladybug Tools made our life easy because we knew who can help. We just needed mm -hmm. to get enough funding to hire them one day. <laughs> <So laughs> right. gotcha. That was like our, our uh, hiring a strategy. Just had the list and like, okay, now let's go to the next. Now, boom. <laughs> No, and you're you're making something like I think environmental analysis, like maybe I'm being a neophyte and calling it just that, but you're making it look cool again, which you know, like beyond actually that, you know, color for designer results, which is something that I grew up with. But you're making it actually look cool and you're making it like integratable within the design process in a way that actually makes sense. So hats off, like, sorry, I'm, I'm just leaping, so I'm no, dumping no, praise on you. No, no thank you so much. I, again, like I, I, I give all the credit to the team, to, help, to our whole team and our community that made the whole thing possible. And I, hi everyone in the chat, like friends. I, don't yes. want, I just want, don't want to name anyone because then I'm, I'm going to meet someone and that's really awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I think if there is no question, probably we can wrap it up, right? We can wrap it up indeed. Right. Thank you so much for giving us yeah. this talk. And, thank you. Uh, and thank you to your team for putting this together. I know how hard it is and well done. No, we've, yeah. we've done it specifically to get this kind of talk. So thank you, Mustafa. Be sure people you, to check out Pollination, join the user meetup, and um, see you all tomorrow because I think this is yep. the session that this closes. This is the last the session. Yep. Take care. Yes. Yeah. Good day, as they say. Good Bye. Ciao.